The chief executive. Delivery of the policy addressed by the Chief Executive. Chief Executive, I understand that um, your the contents of the policy address is, is very rich. In order that um, we can hear you clearly, and um, you may take off your mask if needed. Chief Executive. Mr. President, honorable members and fellow citizens, today I deliver the first policy address after my assumption of office as the Chief Executive. I deeply feel that I am charged with a heavy responsibility. I keep pondering the questions, what are the major concerns of our people? What is their vision for Hong Kong? And what are their expectations towards the policy address? Here, I express my gratitude to our people and all sectors of the community for offering me a wealth of suggestions over the past three months and to my team for their concerted support. Together, we strive to build a better Hong Kong. The world is undergoing profound changes unseen in a century. The pandemic and rapidly worsening global economic outlook, coupled with high inflation, interest rate highs, tightening monetary policies, trade disputes and geopolitical tensions have weakened the growth momentum of the global economy. This will affect the pace of our economic recovery. Notwithstanding the challenges, Hong Kong has its own overriding advantages and enjoys abundant opportunities under the one country, two systems. With the strongest business environment worldwide, Hong Kong is an international financial, trade and shipping center, as well as the world's largest offshore renminbi business center. Apart from these, our emerging industries such as innovation and technology are thriving. Hong Kong has advanced infrastructure in both hardware and software, a sound legal system and top-notch talents from all over the world. Located at the heart of Asia, Hong Kong is the most preferred destination for multinational corporations to set up their operations in Asia. An open and diversified metropolis where old and new styles meet, Hong Kong is also an appealing city embracing both Chinese and Western cultures. Under the one country, two systems, Hong Kong has the distinctive advantages of enjoying strong support of the motherland and being closely connected to the world. Having direct access to the huge mainland markets and strong international connectivity at the same time, Hong Kong serves as a bridge linking the mainland and the rest of the world. Key national strategies including the 14 five-year plan, the development of the GBA and the Belt and Road Initiative provide Hong Kong with unlimited opportunities. This year, the greatest encouragement was brought to us by President Xi Jinping's visit to Hong Kong to attend the meeting celebrating the 25th anniversary of Hong Kong's return to the motherland and the inaugural ceremony of the sixth term government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, where he delivered an important speech. President Xi put forward four musts and four proposals and said that Hong Kong will prosper only when its young people thrive. This has reinforced the confidence of all sectors of the community in our future development. I am grateful to President Xi for his important speech, which now serves as my governance blueprint. Hong Kong has achieved a major transition from chaos to order and is now at the crucial stage of advancing from stability to prosperity. In the next five years, I will lead the government's team to unite and motivate all sectors of the community and give full play to our fine traditions of inclusiveness, unity and respect for different viewpoints. We will make our best endeavor, all for better serving our people and better developing Hong Kong, so that the pearl of the Orient will shine brighter than ever. This is a policy address for Hong Kong citizens. I will now outline my governing beliefs, visions and policy initiatives. 
Let us start a new chapter together for Hong Kong. First of all, we have to build a solid foundation for security while upholding the principle and leveraging the advantages of one country, two systems. The principle of one country, two systems is the best institutional safeguard for the long-term prosperity and stability of Hong Kong. As stressed by President Xi Jinping in his important speech delivered on the 1st of July, one country, two systems has been tested repeatedly in practice. So there is no reason for us to change such a good policy, and we must adhere to it in the long run. The President has set a definitive tone and given strong assurances to Hong Kong, dispelling past discussions over the principle of one country, two systems. The top priority of the principle of one country, two systems is to safeguard national sovereignty, security and development interests. As clearly reflected from the experience over the past 25 years since our return to the motherland, we must fully and faithfully implement the principle of one country, two systems, safeguard the Hong Kong SAR's constitutional basis and order, as laid down by the Constitution of the PRC and the Basic Law of the Hong Kong SAR, implement the principle of patriots administering Hong Kong and uphold the overarching principle of safeguarding national security. The more firmly the one country principle is upheld, the greater strength the two systems will be unleashed. Over the past 25 years, Hong Kong has overcome various challenges and forged ahead with progressive developments. Our pace has not slowed despite the changing external environments, the impacts of the epidemic and the social unrest previously. Nevertheless, the prosperity and stability we now enjoy cannot be taken for granted. Having restored order from chaos, we must stay alert to threats and dangers, adopt bottom-line thinking, and sustain our efforts in safeguarding national sovereignty, security and development interests in order to guard vigilantly against the recurrence of threats. Following our transition from chaos to order, Hong Kong is advancing from stability to prosperity, with our constitutional order better safeguarded and our governance systems improved. Development is of overriding importance. Hong Kong has considerable room for development given our sound foundation for growth, as well as the advantages of enjoying strong support of the motherland and being closely connected to the world under the principle of one country, two systems. The development of Hong Kong allows no delay. Social stability is the prerequisite for our development, and we have to get rid of any interference. We must carry on the mainstream values characterized by the love of both the motherland and, the country and Hong Kong as the core and in conformity with the principle of one country, two systems, and motivates the whole community to work together to create a better future. We will continue to steadfastly safeguard the constitutional order of the Hong Kong SAR and our country's fundamental system set out under the Constitution. We will further strengthen publicity and education on the Constitution, the Basic Law, and the Law of the People's Republic of China on Safeguarding National Security Law in Hong Kong, the Basic Law Promotion Steering Committee, led by the Chief Secretary for Administration, will be renamed the Constitution and the Basic Law Promotion Steering Committee to underline the importance the government attaches to the promotion of the Constitution as well as our determination to take forward relevant work. To further preserve the dignity of the original flag and the original album as a symbol and, and sign of Hong Kong SAR, the government will introduce into the legislative amendments to the regional flag and regional emblem ordinance within the current legislative year to align with national flag and national emblem ordinance and the national anthem ordinance as appropriate. To ensure the faithful adherence to the legislative intent of the national security law, we will further strengthen the legal system and enforcement mechanisms for safeguarding national security by pressing ahead with the preparatory work for the enactment of legislation to implement Article 23 of the Basic Law, legislating for the regulation of online and offline crowdfunding activities, making laws for enhancing cybersecurity of critical infrastructure, completing the consultancy study on addressing the issue of false information for policy consideration, etc. To implement Patriots administering Hong Kong, the government will strictly adhere to the improved electoral system in organizing various elections in accordance with the law. Patriots aspiring to participate in politics and policy debates will be given the opportunities to be elected in a fair, just and open manner. Moreover, the government will, on the basis of integrity and competence, draw widely on outstanding individuals who love the motherland and Hong Kong and with resolute stance, strong governance capabilities and the passion to serve the community into the government and various committees and public bodies. I will strengthen and implement the executive-led structure and continue to explore ways to foster constructive and interactive relationships between the executive and the legislature. 
The anti-chamber exchange sessions will be refined to strengthen exchanges with members of the LegCo so as to achieve better collaboration in policy formulation. Together, we can enhance our governing cap capability by following through decisions made after informed discussion. The government will safeguard independence judicial power. We fully support the judiciary in exercising its judicial power independently in accordance with the law and protect and support judges, prosecutors and legal practitioners in discharging their duties in accordance with the law. We will safeguard the administration of justice and the rule of law to enhance the confidence of the public and the international community in our rule of law. The government will establish the Steering Committee on Rule of Law Education to be chaired by the Secretary for Justice to launch a new Rule of Law Education Train the Trainers program for promoting consistent and correct messages on the rule of law in the community. We will further improve governance. To improve governance, we have to start with enhancing our governance systems, governance capability and governance efficacy. I will improve our governance systems on various fronts, including the decision-making structure, institutional objectives, leadership roles, distribution of powers and responsibilities, as well as execution mechanisms. The establishment of four task forces in the first month after my assumption of office was an institutional setup to address issues relating to intergenerational poverty, district environmental hygiene, public housing supply, as well as coordination of land and housing supply. These governance systems have already achieved some positive results. Amongst them, the District Matters Coordination Task Force, led by the Deputy Chief Secretary for Administration, successfully tackled a number of hygiene and street obstruction black spots in a short period of time, including restoring a public back alley in Tokwa Wan that had been illegally occupied for many years. In the ensuing chapters, I will introduce how we establish and improve our governance systems on various fronts. In respect of the governance system on government investments, I have asked the Financial Secretary to set up a new Hong Kong Investments Corporation Limited, or HKIC, to further optimize the use of fiscal reserves for promoting the development of industries and the economy. The HKIC will consolidate the Hong Kong Growth Portfolio, the GBA Investment Fund and the Strategic Tech Fund established under the Future Fund in recent years, as well as the Co-Investment Fund mentioned in the ensuing sections. In pooling together relevant resources under the steer of the government to invest in strategic industries, we aim to attract and support more enterprises to develop their business in Hong Kong. On enhancing governance capability and governance advocacy, I will set up the Chief Executive's Policy Unit, or the CEPU, within this year to enhance our capabilities in research and advocacy on long-term and strategic issues. The CEPU should possess strategic and global perspectives and stay in tune with the local and public pulse while conducting in-depth studies and analysis on mainland policies and developments as well as international trends and reporting the outcomes to me. It will also put in place a mechanism for regular internal deliberations to assist the government in formulating forward-looking policies. We have to stand united as one. Governance capability of the government rise on the concerted efforts of leaders and team members. The two must act closely with one another in order to achieve the synergy effect of 1 plus 1 is greater than 2 create the greatest value and allow people to benefit most. I value team spirit because I understand that even the most competent individual has limitation. Our team members should perform their respective functions and various departments and the staff should complement each other, while the top echelon should provide steer and intervene proactively to nip problems in the bud. I am pleased that our team acts in concert and shares the same beliefs with me. The secretaries of departments and deputy secretaries of departments have been taking an active role in coordinating work across bureaus and departments. Directors of bureaus have also made strenuous efforts in offering constructive policy ideas and suggestions. Working with one heart and one vision, our team is serving the public with assiduity. 
I've introduced the red team concept in our day-to-day -day decision making. The red team will play the role of critics and opponents to facilitate a thorough review of the effectiveness of policy decisions and execution plans so as to plug any loopholes and improve the policies. We have to be result-oriented. While pressing ahead with various policy initiatives, the government should in particular take heed of the need for our people to have a sense of gain and a real taste of the fruits of effective governance. The government should work in compliance with procedural propriety and, more importantly, to be result-oriented. I have set about 110 various indicators, including key performance indicators or KPIs, as listed in the Annex, for monitoring the progress and effectiveness for specified tasks and making timely improvements. I have also asked all policy bureaus and departments to set more indicators and report them to the electrical. On strengthening the civil service management system. To lead Hong Kong in moving ahead, we need a capable government that can deliver results. The civil service being the backbone of government is the key. To strengthen civil service management, we will first update the civil service code to clearly spell out the core values and standards of conduct that present day civil servants should uphold. Civil servants should be dedicated to their duties, be people-oriented, embrace teamwork, and be ready to take up commitments and responsibilities. They should have strong awareness of safeguarding national sovereignty, security, and development interests, and put the principle of patriots administering Hong Kong into practice. Second, strengthen the reward and punishment system by launching the Chief Executive's Award for Exemplary Performance next year to recognize meritorious and exemplary teams or individuals on a regular basis, with a view to encouraging civil servants to constantly strive for excellence. We will also identify officers with good potential and outstanding performance and provide them with enhanced training and advancement opportunities. For officers whose performance remains persistently substandard despite supervision and assistance, their appointment should be terminated in a timely manner. We will enhance the civil service disciplinary mechanism so that appropriate punishment can be promptly imposed in a fair and just manner on officers found to have misconducted themselves. Third, enhance training for civil servants to build a result-oriented team culture, deepen their understanding of one country, two systems, and contemporary China, and broaden their global perspectives. And fourth, enhance the existing mobilization protocol by introducing a government-wide mobilization level. Rosters will be drawn up in advance to include designated personnel from various departments who will stand ready to cope with major incidents that require deployment of considerable manpower. Regular drills will also be conducted to strengthen the government's emergency response capability. We will continue to create strong impetus for growth. Hong Kong is one of the most competitive economies in the world. It also serves as an important gateway connecting the mainland with global markets. We must be more proactive and aggressive in competing for enterprises and competing for talents. To enhance our competitiveness, the government will put in place new institutional setups and implement an array of new initiatives targeted at attracting enterprises, investments and talents. We will 1. Establish the Office for Attracting Strategic Enterprises, or OASES, led by the Financial Secretary, for attracting strategic enterprises from the mainland and overseas by offering them special facilitation measures and one-stop services. 2. Establish the Talents Service Unit, led by the Chief Secretary for Administration, for formulating strategies to recruit talents from the mainland and overseas and coordinating relevant work as well as providing one-stop support for incoming talents. 3. Set up dedicated teams for attracting businesses and talents in the mainland offices and overseas economic and trade offices, or ETOs, of the governments to proactively reach out to target enterprises and talents and persuade them to pursue developments in Hong Kong. 4. Set aside $30 billion from the Future Fund to establish the Co-Investment Fund for attracting enterprises to set up operations in Hong Kong and investing in their business. 5. Launch the Top Talents Pass Scheme to widely entice talents to pursue their careers in Hong Kong. 6. Enhance existing talent admission schemes to better attract talents. And 7. 
allow eligible incoming talents to, upon becoming permanent residents, apply for a refund of the extra stamp duty paid for purchasing residential property in Hong Kong. The OASES to be established within this year will be tasked with attracting high potential and representative strategic enterprises from around the globe, particularly those from industries of strategic importance such as life and health technology, artificial intelligence and data science, financial technology or fintech, and advanced manufacturing and new energy technology. The office will 1. Draw up a list of targets and enterprises and provide steered to the dedicated teams for attracting businesses and talents to reach out to reach out to and carry out negotiations with the enterprises. Two, formulate attractive special facilitation measures covering aspects such as land, tax, and financing that are applicable exclusively to target enterprises, and provide them with tailor-made plans to facilitate the setting up of their operations in Hong Kong. And three, provide the employees of these target enterprises with one-stop facilitation services in areas such as visa application and ed education arrangements for the children. With the establishment of the co-investment fund, the government will consider co-investing in individual projects of target enterprises, taking into account the potential to drive industry development in Hong Kong. In addition, we will set up the Advisory Committee on Attracting Strategic Enterprises, comprising representatives from relevant business sectors and social leaders, to advise the Financial Secretary on the overall strategy. On trawling for talents, over the past two years, the local workforce shrank by about 140,000. Apart from actively nurturing and retaining local talents, the government will proactively trawl the world for talents. We will 1. Launch the Top Talents Pass scheme for a period of two years. Eligible talents will include individuals whose annual salary reached 2.5 million Hong Kong dollars or above in the past year, and individuals graduated from the world's top 100 universities with at least three years of work experience over the past five years. These two categories of talents will be issued a two-year pass for exploring opportunities in Hong Kong and are not subject to any quota. Individuals who graduated from the world's top 100 universities in the past five years and have yet to fulfill the work, ex work experience requirements will also be eligible, subject to an annual quota of 10,000. The scheme will be reviewed after the first year of implementation. 2. Streamline the General Employment Policy or GEP and the Admission Scheme for Mainland Talents and Professionals or the ASMTP, such that for vacancies falling under the 13 professions with shortage of local supply as listed in the talents list, or for vacancies with annual salary of 2 million Hong Kong dollars or above, employers are not required to provide proof to substantiate their difficulties in local recruitment in making applications for talent admission. The government will update the talent list as soon as possible to reflect the latest shortage situation in various professions and will aim to complete it in the first quarter of year 2023. 3. Suspend the annual quota under the Quality Migrant Admission Scheme or QMAS for a period of two years and improve the approval process to attract more world-class talents to relocate to Hong Kong. 4. Relax the immigration arrangements for non-local graduates. By extending the limits of stay from one year to two years to facilitate their staying in or coming to Hong Kong for work. And expand the scope of the arrangements to cover those who graduated from the GBA campus of a Hong Kong university on a pilot's basis for a period of two years. The pilot's arrangement will be reviewed after the first year of implementation. 5. Enhance the Technology Talent Admission Scheme, TAC TAS, by lifting the requirements for technology firms to employ additional local employees while admitting talents outside Hong Kong, with a view to speeding up talent admission. 6. Extend the limits of stay of employment visas so that talents admitted under the existing and newly launched talent admission schemes and security and employment may be issued with an employment visa, which will be valid for a maximum period of three years. And seven, 
refund the extra stamp duty paid by eligible incoming talents in purchasing residential property in Hong Kong. Eligible talents who purchase a residential property in Hong Kong from today and thereafter and subsequently become a permanent resident upon residing in Hong Kong for seven years can apply for a refund of the buyer's stamp duty and the new residential stamp duty paid for the first residential property purchased which they still own. While the Ethereum stamp duty at scale 2 rates is still payable, such that the overall stamp duty charged will be on par with that charged on first-time home buyers who are ordinary permanent residents. The arrangement applies to any sale and purchase agreement entered from today, that is the 19th of October 2022, and thereafter. At the same time, we will waive the requirement the requirements of applying for an employment visa for more visitors participating in short-term activities in Hong Kong. Apart from existing designated sectors like technology specialists and professional athletes, we will explore expanding the arrangements to more categories. We will soon establish the talent service unit, which will be the one-stop shop coordinating with the immigration departments to process applications received under the talent admission schemes and providing support services. It will also draw performance pledges to enhance efficiency in processing applications. Moreover, we will launch electronic services for all visa applications within this year. The government will expand the functions of mainland offices and overseas ETOs. A total of 17 offices will each set up a dedicated team for attracting businesses and talents. They will proactively reach out to target enterprises and talents, liaise with the world's top 100 universities, and promote related schemes. They will also strengthen links with, the Hong, Kong, with Hong Kong people studying or working in the mainland or overseas, encouraging them to return to Hong Kong. We will also project manpower requirements for supporting the economy. Many sectors in Hong Kong are facing manpower shortages. Relevant bureaus will listen to the views of the sectors and put forward solutions having regard to the situation of individual sectors. For example, on the premise that local workers' priority for employment will be safeguarded, the Labour and Welfare Bureau, or the LWB, will launch a special scheme next year to allow the importation of care workers for residential care homes for the elderly, that is RCHA, and residential care homes for persons with disabilities on an appropriate scale, relax the ratio of care workers to be imported, and streamline vetting procedures for applications with a view to assisting the sector in enhancing service quality. The Development Bureau and the Transport and Logistics Bureau will review the labour shortage situation in the construction and transport sectors, respectively, to draw up relevant solutions. The LWB will commence a new round of manpower projections to help the government formulate appropriate strategies to address the overall manpower demand. We will enhance the methodology, including shortening the projection period from 10 years previously to 5 years to reflect the trends in our economic and labour markets in a more timely manner. Key findings will be available in 2024. We will dovetail with national strategies to create strong impetus for growth. National strategies, including the 14-5-year plan, the GBA developments and the Belt and Road Initiative, have injected continuous impetus to the growth of Hong Kong. The 14-5-year plan has supported the development of the eight centres in Hong Kong. Our priority is to reinforce our position as an international financial centre and promote the development of two emerging industries, namely the INT and arts and culture. At the same time, we will continue to play our role as an international trade centre and fully capitalise on our shipping and aviation developments to enhance our functions in the regional supply chain. We will also continue to enhance our strengths in legal services and develop Hong Kong into a regional intellectual property or IP trading centre. The GBA development has enhanced the interconnectivity and integrated development among GBA cities. The government will make good use of the strengthened Guangdong Hong Kong and Hong Kong Shenzhen cooperation mechanisms and utilize the relevant task forces as platforms to deepen collaboration with other GBA cities. We will also actively participate in the development of major platforms for Guangdong Hong Kong Macau cooperation, including Qinghai of Shenzhen, Nansha of Guangzhou, 
Hang Chin of Zhuhai and the Shenzhen Hong Kong Lok Ma Loop. Meanwhile, the Belt and Road Initiative brings tremendous opportunities to our service industry, creating wider networks by fostering people-to-people -people bonds. The government will establish the steering group on integration into national developments to be chaired by the chief executive, with three secretaries of departments, that is, the Chief Secretary for Administration, the Financial Secretary and the Secretary for Justice as deputies. The steering group will press ahead with initiatives across bureaus and provide steer from a strategic and macro perspective, enhance communications with mainland authorities, and regularly host briefing sessions on national policies. The work of the steering group will cover four major areas. One, formulating strategic plans for Hong Kong to dovetail with the 14-5-year plan and the GBA development, and proactively forging ahead with development and collaboration. Two, formulating work plans and priorities with a view to fostering a greater flow of people, goods, capital, and information within the GBA. Three, strengthening regional cooperation mechanisms with mainland provinces and municipalities, and monitoring the progress and effectiveness of the implementation of collaborative projects. And four, proactively promoting high-quality development of cooperation between Hong Kong and the Belt and Road countries in trade and commerce, professional services and cultural exchanges, and formulating relevant measures. On the sustaining growth of our status as an international financial centre, Hong Kong is the international financial centre, the world's largest offshore RMB business centre, and a leading fundraising hub for biotechnology. The financial services sector is Hong Kong's biggest pillar industry accounting for more than one-fifth of our gross domestic products. To enhance Hong Kong's competitiveness in financial services, we will 1. Enhance our position as a global fundraising platform. The Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited, or the HKEX, will revise the main board listing rules next year to facilitate fundraising of advanced technology enterprises that have yet to meet the profits and trading record requirements. It is also planning to revitalize GEM, that is formerly known as the uh, Growth Enterprise Markets, to provide small and medium enterprises and startups with a more effective fundraising platform. Two, enhance our streams as the largest offshore RMB business center. Hong Kong currently processes about 75% of offshore RMB settlements globally. We will promote the launch of more RMB denominated investment tools and the provision of stable and highly efficient treasury services such as foreign exchange, exchange rate risk, and interest rate risk management tools in the market. We will also enhance market infrastructure. 3. Promote mutual market access. We will speed up the implementation of a series of mutual market access arrangements supported by the China Securities Regulatory Commission earlier, including introducing a bill within this year to exempt the stamp duty payable for transactions conducted by due counter market makers with a view to enhancing the RMB stock trading mechanism, as well as completing preparations for the launch of the northbound trading of Swap Connect as early as possible. We will also explore enhancements to the southbound trading of Bond Connect so as to facilitate the issuance and trading of more diverse dim sum bonds and continue the discussion with the mainland on proposals for the further expansion of mutual market assets. Moreover, we will strive to establish insurance after-sales service centres in places such as Nansha and Tianhai in the near future to provide support services for residents in the GBA holding Hong Kong policies. This is also an important step towards mutual assets of insurance markets in the GBA. 4. Develop green and sustainable finance. We will promote the development of Hong Kong as a premier financing platform for governments and green enterprises in the mainland and around the world. We are also developing Hong Kong into an international carbon market and will support the HKEX to continue pursuing cooperation with, among others, financial institutions in Guangzhou in carbon markets development. 5. Strengthen assets and risk management. Family offices is a key growth segment of the asset and wealth management industry. Last year, Hong Kong managed over $1,700 billion of relevant assets, including those for private trust clients. The government will introduce a bill within this year to offer tax concession for eligible family offices. 
The target is attracting no less than 200 family offices to establish or expand their operations in Hong Kong by the end of year 2025. Moreover, we will implement a risk-based capital regime for the insurance industry in year 2024 to align with international standards and launch a public consultation within this year on the proposal of establishing a policyholders protection scheme. And five and six, continuously enhance our competitiveness in fintech. Currently, there are more than 600 fintech companies in Hong Kong. We will vigorously promote fintech by encouraging more fintech services and products to undergo proof of concept trials, taking forward cross boundary fintech projects, and nurturing fintech talents. The commercial data interchange will be launched within this year to provide a one-stop platform for enterprises to share operational data, enabling banks to make accurate assessments on the operating condition of enterprises and providing SMEs with a better chance of securing loans. On virtual assets, the government has introduced a bill to propose establishing a statutory licensing regime for virtual asset service providers. The Hong Kong Monetary Authority, or the HKMA, is examining markets' feedback on the regulation of stablecoins and will ensure that the regulatory regime is in line with both the international regulatory recommendations and the local context. The HKMA has also begun the preparatory work for issuing eHKD and is collaborating with the mainland institutions to expand the testing of eCNY as a cross-boundary payment facility in Hong Kong. On our status as the International Innovation and Technology Centre, INT provides key impetus for Hong Kong's high-quality economic development. To charge Hong Kong in moving full steam towards our vision of an international INT centre, the government will promulgate the Hong Kong INT development blueprint within this year to set out major policies under four broad development directions. First, to enhance the INT ecosystem and achieve reindustrialization in Hong Kong, we will 1. Promote commercialization of research and development or R&D outcomes. Hong Kong has strong capabilities in scientific research. We will earmark $10 billion to launch the Research, Academic and Industry Sectors 1 Plus Scheme or the RAISE Plus Scheme next year. It will fund on a matching basis at least 100 research teams in universities which have a good potential to become startups. Each team should complete its project in two stages. The first stage for the transformation and realization of R&D outcomes within three years, and the second stage for the commercialization of R&D outcomes within the subsequent two years. The aim is to incentivize collaboration among industry, academic and research sectors to further promote the one to n transformation of R&D outcomes and the industry development. Two, promotes the development of technology industry. We will actively promote Hong Kong's new opportunities to the mainland and overseas. By collaborating with the OASES and making use of the $5 billion strategic tech fund, as well as the land and space provided for INT users starting from 2024 in the Hong Kong Shenzhen Innovation and Technology Park or the HSITP in the Lok Chau Loop, we will attract high-quality enterprises and talents to Hong Kong, primarily focusing on industries such as life and health technology, artificial intelligence and data science, as well as advanced manufacturing and new energy technology. Our goal is to attract not less than 100 high-potential or representative INT enterprises to set up or expand their businesses in Hong Kong in the coming five years, including at least 20 top-notch INT enterprises, bringing more than $10 billion of investments to Hong Kong and creating thousands of local job opportunities. Three, press ahead with reindustrialization. 
We will create the post of Commissioner for Industry, who will coordinate and steer the strategy on reindustrialization and assist the manufacturing sector in upgrading and transformation by making use of INT. We will explore the construction of the second advanced manufacturing centre at the Taipo Inno Park. We will also subsidise the setting up of more smart production lines in Hong Kong under the reindustrialization funding scheme, with the target of increasing the cumulative number of smart production lines by four times from about 30 at present to over 130 in five years. Furthermore, we will strengthen the collaboration with the Hong Kong Productivity Council to support enterprises in upgrading to smart production. And four, strengthen infrastructure and facilities. We will move full steam ahead with the construction of the HSITP and expedite the development of Santin Tanupo in the northern metropolis. The expansion works of the Science Park and Cyberport will be completed in phases from year 2025 onward, providing 100,000 square metres of additional floor area. We are also planning the Science Park Pakshekok station of the East Rail Line for commissioning by year 2033. Second, to enlarge the INT talent pool to create strong impetus for growth, with additional measures focusing on attracting INT talents. We will 1. Attract leading INT talents around the globe. By collaborating with the OASES, we will provide special facilitation measures in a targeted manner to attract top-notch INT talents to bring with them their business or R&D outcomes to Hong Kong. 2. Enhance existing technology talent schemes. We will enhance the TAC TAS by lifting the local employment requirements, extending the quota validity period to two years, and expanding the coverage to more emerging te technology areas. In addition, we will increase the subsidies provided for research institutions and INT enterprises for employing research talents under the Research Talents Hub scheme by about 10%. Research talents with a doctoral degree will be further provided with a living allowance. 3. Enhance accommodation support. We will build more accommodation facilities for INT talents, including to explore the development of a new Inno cell near Science Park and accommodation facilities for talents as the HSITP. In support of the development of Santin Technopo, we will allow greater planning for flexibility to provide additional accommodation for INT talents. And four, expand the STEM inter internship scheme. We will offer local INT internship opportunities to university students studying STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics programs overseas or at GBA campuses established by designated local universities. Third, to develop Hong Kong into a smart city to improve the quality of life of our people. We will build a smart government. We aim to turn all government services online in two years and provide one-stop digital services by fully adopting I am smart within three years so as to realize single portal for online government services. In addition, 100 digital government projects will be launched with the application of technology for the convenience of the public. 2. Open up data. The government will continue to actively open up data and encourage public and private organizations to follow suit for innovative industry applications. We will also explore with the mainland the arrangements for the flow of data from the mainland to Hong Kong with a view to jointly promoting the coordinated development of smart cities in the GBA, and free, expand the 5G network. We will further expand the 5G network by amending the legislation next year to ensure that appropriate space is made available in new buildings for installation of mobile communication facilities. Fourth, to proactively integrate into the overall development of the country and consolidate Hong Kong's advantages as an international city, 
The HSITP is the bridgehead for INT cooperation between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. On the basis of one song, two parks, and through in-depth cooperation with Shenzhen, we will study the trial implementation of a cross-boundary policy on INT cooperation in an innovative, exclusive, and designated manner, covering the flows of INT material, capital, data, and people between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. We will proactively attract mainland and overseas INT enterprises to the HSITP, providing key impetus for the development of an international INT centre in the GBA. Recently, our country has announced for the first time the recruitment of payload specialists in Hong Kong to participate in the National Manned Space Programme, fully reflecting the great importance our country attaches to Hong Kong's technology sector. We are actively supporting and facilitating the recruitment exercise to recommend suitable candidates for our country. I look forward to our country's continuing support of Hong Kong's participation in more national pioneering technology missions. On developing Hong Kong into an East Meets West Center for International Cultural Exchange, Embracing both Chinese and Western cultures, Hong Kong has established its cultural infrastructure and global network over the years and drawn in a vast pool of outstanding talents from around the world. The West, the West Kowloon Cultural District has become a new cultural landmark earning worldwide acclaim. In recent years, Hong Kong has even become one of the three largest art markets in the world. The current term government is committed to fostering the cultural developments of Hong Kong to expedite its progression into an East Meets West Centre for International Cultural Exchange. The Secretary for Culture, Sports and Tourism will chair the Culture Commission comprising industry leaders to map out a blueprint for arts and culture and creative industries development and enhance the ecosystem for the industries. We will, one, nurture a diversified talent pool. The, HK, the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts or the HKAPA ranks first in the performing arts category among all higher education institutions in Asia. We have asked the HKAPA to look into ways to nurture arts and cultural talents for Hong Kong and the GBA and to establish a new campus in the northern metropolis and raise the proportion of non-local students. Moreover, we will launch various arts and cultural internship programs and subsidize HKAPA students or those studying arts and cultural programs in universities to undertake internships in arts groups and the WKCD. Additional resources will also be deployed to support and nurture promising and budding arts groups and artists. The LCSD will continue to collaborate with the WKCD in grooming more professionals to develop Hong Kong into a regional centre for arts conservation and restoration. Also, to establish a thriving and diversified arts, cultural and creative ecosystem, we will continue to attract more talents in and outside Hong Kong to pursue their aspirations here. 2. Continuously upgrade cultural infrastructure. We will map out a new 10-year development blueprint for arts and cultural facilities, including plans to increase the number of LCSD's museums to 19 and the number of seats at performance venues by about 50%. The East Kowloon Cultural Center will be commissioned in phases starting from next year and will become a base for accelerating the promotion and application of integrated arts plus tech. To leverage market forces for the development of the arts and cultural sector, we will also devise measures to encourage the provision of arts and cultural facilities such as theatres in private developments. Three enrich arts, cultural and creative contents. We will establish the Mega Arts and Cultural Events Fund to promote the staging of more international arts and cultural events in Hong Kong, taking into account the views of the Mega Arts and Cultural Events Committee, which will include industry personnel. The government will foster arts and cultural exchanges and collaboration with the mainland including organizing the GPA Culture and Arts Festival in year 2024, as well as the annual Hong Kong Week and Chinese Opera Festival, etc. To promote Hong Kong's pop culture to go global, we will strive to expand the industry's development capacity with free foci on film, TV and streaming platforms, respectively. Create Hong Kong 
will support collaboration between local and the mainland Asian production teams for co-production of films and television variety programs, as well as development of new content on streaming platforms by cross-sectoral production teams. The government also plans to collaborate with industry practitioners to organize an annual pop culture festival and explores the feasibility of setting up a pop culture center in the long term. And four, promote platforms for arts and cultural industries. Hong Kong is a home to a number of globally acclaimed platforms for fostering the development of arts, cultural and creative industries, including Art Basel Hong Kong, Hong Kong International Film and TV Market, and Business of Design Week. The first Hong Kong Performing Arts Market will also take place in year 2024. We will invite the Hong Kong Trade Development Council to enhance its Asia IP exchange portal with a view to creating favorable conditions for the development of arts and cultural industries. We will also explore measures to support the industries in widening the scope of copyright trading activities so as to foster the commercialization and development of arts, cultural and creative industries. On international trade, Hong Kong is the world's sixth largest commodity trading center. We are actively pursuing accession to the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, which covers 15 countries and a population of 2.2 billion and accounts for nearly 30% of the global trade volume. Accession to RCEP will help enterprises reduce their operating costs and open up overseas markets, thereby strengthening and capitalizing on Hong Kong's status as an international trade center. We strive to support the convention and exhibition industry in order to help SMEs obtain more overseas orders. We will extend the convention ex exhibition industry subsidy scheme to the 30th of June next year. A new $1.4 billion scheme will be launched thereafter to subsidize more than 200 exhibitions to be staged in Hong Kong over three years. To consolidate Hong Kong's status as an as a premier venue for large-scale international CNE activities, we will take forward the Asia World Expo Phase 2 project. Together with the One China North Redevelopment Project near the Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center to substantially increase large-scale CNE spaces. To provide further support for SMEs, we will 1. Raise the level of funding support. The cumulative funding ceiling per enterprise under the dedicated fund on branding, upgrading and domestic sales or the BUD fund will be raised from $6 million to $7 million. To assist SMEs in developing markets outside Hong Kong, the cumulative funding ceiling per enterprise under the SME Export Marketing Fund will be raised from $0.8 million to $1 million. The special measure to expand its funding scope will also be extended to the 30th of June 2026 to continue to cover exhibitions and online exhibitions targeting the local market and the eligibility criteria will be relaxed to cover non-SMEs. 2. Capitalize on the opportunities in the mainland. Guangdong ETO will set up a dedicated promotion center to support the development of Hong Kong people and enterprises in the GBA. The HKTDC will also set up more Go GBA business support centers to cover all nine mainland cities in the GBA and organize business missions, training, etc. in various mainland provinces and municipalities. 3. Extend the principal payment holiday arrangements. The pre-approved principal payment holiday scheme will be extended for another six months to the 31st of July 2023 through the Banking Sector SME Lending Coordination Mechanism of the HAMA, and the principal repayment option will be enhanced to prepare for the eventual normal principal repayment by enterprises in future. Relevant arrangements will also be applicable to loans under the SME Financing Guarantee Scheme. And four. Extend concessions of government fees and charges. We will continue to reduce 75% of water and sewage charges for non-domestic accounts for eight months 
from the 1st of December 2022 to the 31st of July 2023, subject to a monthly ceiling of $20,000 and $12,500 respectively per household. We will, we will also continue to provide 75% rental or fee concessions currently applicable to eligible tenants of government premises and eligible short-term tenancies and waivers under the Lands Department for six months from the 1st of January 2023 to the 30th of June 2023. On consolidating our status as an international shipping centre, connecting to nearly 600 destinations worldwide and handling about 18 million 20 foot equivalent units of containers last year, Hong Kong Port is one of the 10 busiest container ports in the world. To consolidate our status as an international shipping centre, we will implement tax concession measures to attract more high-value-added maritime enterprises to establish presence in Hong Kong. We will also launch a maritime service, services traineeship scheme next year to provide traineeship for young people who aspire to a career in maritime law. We will actively promote the development of smart ports to strengthen the competitiveness of our ports by setting up a port community system to facilitate the flow and sharing of data among operators and other stakeholders. On the other hand, the government will also upgrade the infrastructure of land boundary control points or BCPs, including rationalizing the land BCPs and clearance arrangements under the East-in, East-out, West-in, West-out strategy for cross-boundary goods movements, and adopting co-location arrangements and collaborative inspection and joint clearance mode for planning the redevelopment of the Shuttlecock Port, Hong Kong Shenzhen Western Rail Link, and bifurcation of the Northern Link. This year, we will work with the Hong Kong Logistics Development Council and the trade to start formulating an action plan to promote high-value-added modern logistics developments in three major directions. 1. Reinforcing intermodal transport by integrating air, sea and land transport to strengthen the key role played by Hong Kong in the logistics chain of the GBA. Two. Leveraging our strengths in handling high-value goods to promote the development of high-end and high-value-added logistics services, such as the processing of cold-chain goods, fresh food, and pharmaceuticals. And three, encouraging a wider application of smart logistics solutions by the logistics trade to enhance competitiveness through technology. On developing Hong Kong into an international aviation hub, the Hong Kong International Airport is a globally preeminent international aviation hub. We are working with the Airport Authority Hong Kong, that is AAHK, to fully realize the airport city vision. With the third runway commencing operation in July 2022, the free runway system is expected to be completed in year 2024 and will substantially increase the overall capacity and competitiveness of the airport. The AAHK is also actively taking forward various projects and applying the intermodal transport mode to enhance connectivity between the airports and the GBA cities. For instance, the commissioning of the Sky Pier terminal next year will provide direct transfer facilities for passengers from the GBA to streamline immigration formalities. The Hong Kong International Aviation Academy will work with aviation training institutions in the mainland to send young people to the airports on each side for internships starting from the first half of 2023. About 300 places will be provided in the first year. The Academy will continue to partner with the National School of Civil Aviation of France to co-organize the Advanced Master Program in Air Transport Management so as to attract prospective students from Belt and Road countries and consolidate Hong Kong's position as a regional aviation training center. Moreover, we will develop Hong Kong into the preferred location for aircraft leasing in the region by further enhancing the aircraft leasing preferential tax regime. On developing Hong Kong into the Center for International Legal and Dispute Resolution Services in the Asia-Pacific region, 
As an international legal center, Hong Kong possesses a robust legal system, a solid foundation for the rule of law and rich pool of outstanding legal talents. Last year, Hong Kong was ranked the third most preferred seat for arbitration globally. Leveraging the advantages of our common law system, we will attract more international dispute resolution institutions to set up offices in Hong Kong and will consolidate our streams as an international legal services platform for deal making and dispute resolution. To enhance the efficiency and competitiveness of the legal sector, we will also promote the wider use of law tech. We will first enhance promotion. Starting with the Hong Kong Law Week 2022 scheduled for this November, the Department of Justice of the DOJ will lead delegations of local legal profession to conduct overseas visits from next year to showcase to the international community the advantages of Hong Kong's rule of law as well as our diversified legal and dispute resolution services under the common law system. In particular, the various mutual legal assistance arrangements on civil and commercial matters between Hong Kong and the mainland. 2. Support emerging industries. The DOJ will develop user-friendly and practical legal guides and tools such as boilerplates of commonly used contractual terms for financial services, INT, arts, cultural and creative industries, etc. to facilitate the provision and use of legal services by those within and outside the industry. And 3. Enhance interaction with the GBA. The DOJ will establish a task force to focus on strengthening mutual legal assistance between the GBA and Hong Kong and facilitating the convergence of legal practices between the two places. The DOJ will also establish an online mediation platform dedicated to dispute resolution in the GBA within next year to facilitate interactions between people and business of the two places. I could. On Regional Intellectual Property Trading Center, the government will develop Hong Kong into a regional IP trading center by leveraging the institutional advantages of Hong Kong's legal and IP protection system. We will 1. Strengthen protection of IP rights. We plan to achieve the following targets next year to complete the preparatory work for implementing the International Trademark Registration System, to secure passage of the Amendment Bill to the Copyright Ordinance to strengthen copyright protection in the digital environment, and to roll out a pilot project with the China National Intellectual Property Administration to enable Hong Kong applicants to enjoy prioritized examination of qualified patent applications in the mainland. A medium-term goal is to conduct a review of the registered designs regime in year 2024. We will also enhance the substantive examination capability of patent examiners under the original grant patent system and develop a talent pool with a view to acquiring institutional autonomy in conducting substantive patent examination by year 2030. 3. Build capacity. Our target is to provide IP training for 5,000 personnel across different industries within the current term of the government. And 3. Promote widely. We will promote Hong Kong's IP trading and professional services through various activities, including the HKTDC's Business of IP Asia Forum, organized annually. The HKTDC will also enhance its Asia IP Exchange portal next year to facilitate different sectors to further explore commercial opportunities in IP trading. Furthermore, we will actively develop Northern Metropolis as the new engine for growth. The Northern Metropolis is the foothold for Hong Kong's strategic development as well as the new engine for Hong Kong to scale new heights. The current term government will take forward the development of the Northern Metropolis in full steam. A number of major development projects in the area have already commenced will enhance quantity, speed, efficiency and quality in various aspects to vigorously compress the time required for turning pieces of primitive land into spate-ready sites for major projects by half from more than 10 years in the past. 
the government would establish a steering committee on the Northern Metropolis and advisory committee on the Northern Metropolis to strengthen the governance structure for the development of this area. The former will be led by the chief executive to provide high-level policy steer and supervision, the latter to be chaired by the financial secretary and comprising experts and stakeholders in the community who tender advice and suggestions. The Hong Kong SAL government will collaborate closely with the Guangdong Provincial Government with a view to enabling the North northern metropolis to radiate beyond its geographical boundary and creating synergy with the Guangdong province, the Somjun municipality and the GBA. A department dedicated to the development of Northern Metropolis will also be set up next year to steer various departments and coordinate their innovative efforts in pressing ahead with the development. Our target is to formulate a concrete plan and an action agenda for the Northern Metropolis within next year. Upon completion, the Northern Metropolis will emerge as a new international INT city, integrating quality life new economies, and culture and leisure. Innovative urban design will help promote home job balance, green living, and the coexistence of development and conservation. We will fully leverage the advantages of the northern metropolis proximity to the hinterland to promote the comprehensive development of control point areas. On its west, the Hong Sui Q Hachun New Development Area would be the focus. With its geographical proximity to Qianhai, it will become a central business district with a catchment reaching Samchan and even the GBA. The central part, with the Santin Techno Po as its core, will pull INT enterprises and create synergy with Samchan's INT cluster just across the river, becoming a diversified test bed for innovation. Modern industries in the new territories. North New Town can also benefit from collaboration with Samchan. Endowed with rich natural and tourism resources, the east side is best place for recreation and tourism development for Hong Kong and Samchan. We will one press ahead with land creation and housing construction. We will take forward in full swing major projects that have commenced in Kutong North, Fanning North. Hong Sui Q, Ha Chun, Yunnong South, etc. Planning for the majority of other development projects such as Shantin Techno Po has already commenced. Our target is to commence land resumption procedures for all development projects within five years and to form 40% of the new development land and complete 40% of the new flats within 10 years. Two, Increase development intensity will make the best use of the land resources in the northern metropolis by adopting higher port ratios. As a guideline, the maximum port ratio for residential sites will be 6.5, higher than that of 5 for earlier generations of new towns like Sha Chin, while that for commercial sites will be 9.5. 3. Make available sites for different industries. Sites uh, will be made available gradually in the next five years to support the development of INT and other industries. Three buildings are under construction in the Lok Ma Chao Loop in Santin Technopo, and part of the land in the loop will be ready for attracting businesses and investment from next year. The first batch of Santin INT sites outside the loop will commence works in 2024. While the first batch of sites for development of industrial buildings in areas earmarked for logistics and emerging industries in Hong Sui Q and Yunnong will be available from next year. Hong Sui Q, Ha Chun, NDA is positioned as a modern surface hub. And site formation works for the commercial sites near Hong Sui Q station will also be completed in 2026. Four. Construct landmark developments. We'll plan for a number of landmark developments in the northern metropolis, such as cluster of cultural facilities, post-secondary education institutions, major sports facilities, hospital networks, and cluster of government facilities to facilitate 
development of the area and to provide a quality living environment. Certain government offices currently in central business districts with no specific local location requirements will be relocated to the northern metropolis, including, for example, nearly 40% of the office floor area in the Queensway government offices, with a view to driving the development of the area and releasing the land in the central business districts. Five, pursue proactive eco ecological conservation. Upon completion of the current study next year, we will implement a new proactive conservation policy to gradually resume private wetlands and fish ponds with ecological value and develop a wetland conservation park system with a view to increasing the environmental capacity for the development of northern metropolis. Separately, we will initiate a statutory procedure for designating about 500 hectares of land in Robin's Nest as a country park in 2024, which will echo with the Samjun Wutong Mountain Scenic Area, creating a cross border ecological corridor between Hong Kong and Samjun. We'll gradually open up Sha Tao Kok, excluding Chong Ying Street in 2024, for cultural and eco tourism activities that will consult the local community early next year. And six, foster cross border interactions. With a favourable location in proximity to the hinterland, the northern metropolis can create synergy with the mainland in areas such as industry development, land use and ecological conservation. Hong Kong and the mainland have already set up task forces under the Guangdong Hong Kong and Hong Kong Samjun Cooperation Mechanism to deliberate on cross-boundary integration proposals for creating greater value for the northern metropolis on uplifting the productivity of the construction industry. In the next few years, the government's annual capital works expenditure will exceed $100 billion. The Development Bureau will establish a cross across the Departmental Steering Committee for coordinating the development of high productivity construction methods, such as Modular Integrated Construction, MIC, and the streamlining of relevant approved approval processes to remove barriers for the industry. The steering committee will formulate measures next year to strengthen the MIC supply chain, including making available land in the northern metropolis for manufacturing and storage of modules by the industry and fostering collaboration within the GPA. In addition to expediting housing supply, these measures will strengthen the leading regional position of Hong Kong's construction industry in the adoption of MIC on supporting local tourism will continue to promote characteristic local tourism by allocating $600 million for three-year cultural and heritage site local tour incentive scheme to encourage the tourism industry to develop products with cultural and heritage elements. In addition, the Hong Kong Tourism Board will launch a new round of spend to redeem local tours and staycation delights with increased quota to enhance local ambience and consumption. To re-establish Hong Kong's position as the region's premier destination for meetings, incentive travels, convention and exhibitions, MICE, the Hong Kong Tourism Board will enhance its support for MICE tourism in light of the epidemic development so as to attract more high-value added overnight visitors to Hong Kong. On the promotion of the sustainable development of the agriculture and fishery industries, the Environment and Ecology Bureau, EEB, will work hard we work hand in hand with the agriculture and fishery industries to formulate a blueprint for the sustainable development of agriculture and fisheries to promote the upgrading and transformation, modernization and sustainable development of the industry. An array of measures covering finance, infrastructure, land and technical support will be rolled out in phases by the EEP to raise the quality and value of local produces as well as the productivity of the industry on earnestly addressing people's concerns and difficulties in daily life. First, land and housing as the top priority. Solving the housing problem tops the agenda of the current term government. To deal with the problems of inadequate accommodation, including subdivider threats, we need breakthroughs in housing supply and solutions to address the long-term problem of housing shortage. The objective is to let people see the hope of getting on the la housing ladder earlier and having more decent housing. According to the final report of the Hong Kong 2030 Plus towards a planning vision and strategy transcending 2030, 
the Hong Kong 2030 Plus. The overall land supply in the coming 30 years, that is from 2019 to 2048, will be over 7,000 hectares, exceeding the demand of some 600 hectares by about 1,000 hectares. Based on the long-term housing strategy, the projected demand for public housing in the next 10 years will be 301,000 units. While we have identified sufficient land to build about 360,000 units, the distribution of public housing production in the coming decade will be uneven. Only about one-third of the units will be completed during the first five-year period from 2023 to 24 to 2027 to 28, while the remaining two-thirds will be completed in the second five-year period. The waiting time is long. We must overcome constraints to create supply and address short-term public housing shortage and ensure a steady private housing supply at the same time. We will enhance Quantity, speed, efficiency and quality in land production, staying on top of things and putting in place a long-term plan to steadily increase supply. Our key strategies and targets include the following. The Steering Committee on Land and Housing Supply and the Task Force on Public Housing Projects, chaired by the Financial Secretary and Deputy Financial Secretary respectively, have submitted to me the first 100-day reports. After considering the proposals in the two reports, I've decided to set the following key strategies and targets. One, introduce the new Light Public Housing, LPH, with about 30,000 units to be built in the coming five years. Two, Increase the overall public housing production substantially by about 50% in the coming five years, from 2023 to 24 to 2027 to 28, as compared uh, to the previous five-year period, taking into account the LPH and traditional PRH. Three, cap the waiting time for PRH immediately, taking into account the total supply of LPH and the traditional PRH, the target is to cap the waiting time at the existing level of about six years and shorten it to about 4.5 years in, the four, in four years' time, that is in 2026 to 27. Four, set a minimum size for newly built flats, the saleable area of all subsidized sale flats completed from 2026 to 27 onward will be no less than 26 square meters in general and the internal air floor area of all newly built PRH units, except for single-person and two-person units, will be no less than the equivalent threshold level in general. Five, deliver sufficient land for private housing development in the next five years to meet the projected demand in the LTHS and stabilize supply for private housing. Six, compress land production procedures such that the time required for turning primitive land into spade-ready sites can be reduced by about one-third to half. Seven, make use of market forces by enhancing public-private partnership. A pilot scheme will be introduced to encourage the participation of private developers in building subsidized sale flats. And eight, expedite land production. Build up a land reserve in the long run and assume a leading role in land supply so that the government will stay on top of things instead of catching up with the demand. We will work closely with the Hong Kong Housing Authority, Hong Kong HA, and the Hong Kong Housing Society, HAHS, to increase public housing supply in the first five-year period by enhancing quantity, speed, efficiency, and quality, thereby shortening the waiting time for PRH. We will, one, introduce the new LPH. The government will make use of government and private land with no development plan in the near future and adopt standardized simple design and the MIC approach to build LPH units expeditiously. About 30,000 units will be completed in five years, increasing the overall public housing supply by about 25%. Those on the waiting list for the traditional 
PRH for three years or more may apply for LPH for earlier allocation of units, and priority will be given to family applicants. Tenants may retain their position in the queue for traditional PRH and can move into traditional PRH later on. LPH units will be provided with basic facilities of traditional PRH units. The rent of LPH will be lower than traditional PRH in the same district who seek LegCo's approval for dedicated funding to build and operate LPH. At the same time, we'll continue to provide about 20,000 transitional housing units through partnership with the community. Taking into account that some 30,000 LPH units, overall public housing production will increase to around 158,000 units in the next five years from 2023 to 24 to 2027 to 28, including the 12,000 PRH units provided under the PRH Advanced Allocation Scheme. and I would uh, give more details later. This represents a significant increase of s some 50% compared to 105,000 units in the previous five-year period. We will introduce a new index for composite waiting time for subsidized rental housing to reflect applicants' composite waiting time for both traditional PRH and LPH on the basis that the number of newly registered re applicants and the qu quantity of recovered PRH units will remain unchanged at the current level the target is to reduce the composite waiting time for subsidized rental housing from six years to about 4.5 years in four years' time. To implement the PRH Advanced Allocation Scheme, the government will adopt a phased approach to expedite the completion of some PRH units. It is expected that about 12,000 units will be available in, next five, in the next five years for advanced allocation of about three to 18 months. Three, Enhanced speed by adopting the MIC approach, we suggest that the Hong Kong HA require all public housing projects scheduled for completion in the first five-year period to adopt the design for manufacturing and assembly DFMA approach. If the adoption of MIC approach in suitable projects in the second five-year period, no less than 50% of projects will adopt the MIC approach. Hong Kong Housing Society will also adopt the MIC approach in more public housing projects. Four, enhanced pu public-private partnership. We, should, we will introduce a new pilot scheme on private developer participation in subsidized housing development. From the next financial year, three sites will be put up for tender in patches for developers to build subsidized sales flats, which will be sold to eligible person at a spec specified discount rate from the market price. Under the pilot scheme, developers are also encouraged to apply for rezoning of their own private land for subsidized cell threat development. And five, accelerate housing production by adopting the design and build model. We suggest that the Hong Kong HA require at least half of the flats scheduled for completion in the second five-year period to adopt the design and build contract model for construction to enhance speed efficiency and quality. To enhance quality, we'll provide better public space, facilities, and a state environment for public housing residents. The Secretary for Housing will chair an action group to develop well-being design guidelines for new public housing projects. We also suggest that Hong Kong HA select five existing PRH estates as pilot projects for phase study and implementation of enhancement measures within five years, with a view to creating a living environment uh, with a greater sense of well-being on private housing supply. Based on the latest projection in the long-term housing strategy, the demand for private housing in the next 10 years will be 129,000 units. We'll work to achieve this basic target and get sufficient land ready for providing no less than 72,000 residential units in the next five years. Such land may be put forward for land sale or railway pro property developments, together with the development projects of the Urban Renewal Authority and other private uh, development projects, the overall supply would exceed projected demand. On building the housing ladder, 
In addition to stabilizing the supply of private housing, the government will make available subsidized cell flats, such as those under the Home Ownership Scheme, Green Form Subsidized Home Ownership Scheme, and Starter Homes for Hong Kong Residents, Starter Homes projects to meet the home ownership aspiration of the public. On land, our objective is to increase uh, reserve and regain the control of supply. We we'll adopt a multi-pronged approach to enhance quantity. To assume a leading role in land supply, the government will identify more land to meet demand and build up the land reserve, including developable land from the, the new round of study on green belt soon and con consultancy study on agricultural priority areas. There are about approximately 16,000 hectares of green belt areas in Hong Kong, but over half of them are subject to clear development constraints, such as steep slopes and uh, ecological sensitivity. Among the remaining 8,000 hectares, 1,200 hectares have been included in various development projects, in a new round of study, we have shortlisted about 255 hectares of green belt sites with potential for housing development, which can provide 70,000 units. The rezoning of the first batch of sites will commence by 2024. The planning department will complete the review of the development potential of all the remaining green, green belt areas next year. We also strive to redevelop brownfield sites. There are currently 1,600 hectares of brownfield sites in the new territories, and more than half of them will gradually be developed for housing and other uses. Take the Kudung North, Fanning North NDA as an example. Brownfield sites with land clearance that began two years ago have completed site formation works this year for handover to the Hong Kong HA for public housing development. While speeding up the resumption of brownfield sites for development, the government would cater to the needs of the, the affected, such as squatter occupants and brownfield operators. For example, we plan to make available in Yunnan and Hong Sui Kyu for development of multi-story industrial buildings from next year, with lease conditions requiring a certain portion of floor area to be set aside for leasing to the affected brownfield operators below market rent. In addition, we we'll put forward the development proposal for Chiang Guan No Area 137 this year. It is expected to provide 50,000 residential units with the first population intake in 2030 at the earliest. We will adopt a multi pronged approach to enhance speed and efficiency to sustain, substantially compress the time required for land production. We will 1. Streamline statutory procedures. We we'll streamline various procedures with respect to planning, environmental impact assessment (EIA), land resumption, and infrastructure through the introduction of a bill to amend the Town Planning Ordinance, the Land Resumption Ordinance, the Foreshore and Seabed Reclamations Ordinance, the Roads, Works, Use, and Compensation Ordinance, and the Railway Ordinance, as well as amendment to the schedules to the EIA Ordinance within this year. For projects other than large-scale ones, the time required for turning primitive land into spade-ready sites for housing development will be reduced from at least six years to four years, while the time required for large-scale projects will be substantially reduced from 13 years to seven years, of which the time for the EIA process will become pressure within 18 to 24 months. We also open up the environmental baseline data next year to enhance the efficiency of the EIA process. Two, further streamline administrative procedures. We review key topics including the gross four area GFA concession arrangement for car parks, approval guidelines concerning developments in the wetland buffer area, cell certification and independent checking arrangement, as well as procedures concerning the felling and compensatory planting of trees. We aim to put forward concrete proposals progressively starting from mid-2023. 3. Expedite the approval of breeding plans. The building department will establish dedicated processing units adopting a facilitator mindset to expedite the approval process of general building plans submitted for high yield private residential buildings. The target is to approve 
80% of the plans on the first or second submission. In addition, we will devise a roadmap on the industry's use of building information modeling, BIM, in preparing building plans for submission to departments for approval. An, appro an application software we will launch in the first quarter of 2024 to automate compliance checks by the industry on the four area information in relevant plans. Four, extend the arrangement for charging land premium at standard rates. We will regularize the arrangement for charging land premium at standard rates for redevelopment of industrial buildings. We also extend this approach, now applicable only to the redevelopment of industrial buildings and in situ land exchange applications in NDAs to cover agricultural land in the NT located outside NDAs to compress relevant workflow. We target to extend a concrete plan by mid-2023. Five, speed up the consolidation of property interest to facilitate urban renewal of all areas. We propose lowering the compulsory sale application thresholds for private buildings aged 50 or above but below 70 from 80% to 70% of ownership and further to 60% for those aged 70 or above. For industrial buildings in non-industrial zoning, the threshold will be lower to 70% of ownership for those aged 30 years or above. We also relaxed requirements on compulsory sale applications covering abutting lots streamline the legal procedure for compulsory sale and set up a dedicated office to provide additional support to affected minority owners. We consult the legal and stakeholders on the proposals within this year. And six, streamline the arrangement for land lease extension. As a considerable number of land leases will expire from 2025 onward, the government will introduce a bill next year such that such that expiring land leases will be extended regularly and in a consistent manner. This will save individual lot owners from dealing with the complicated procedure and bearing expensive costs in executing land extension documents and substantially reduce the time required for lease extension. We will enhance transparency. To, to do this, the Steering Committee on Land and Housing Supply will formulate and regularly publish a 10-year forecast and supply of developable land. The first forecast will be released shortly. Shortly, the Task Force on Public Housing Projects will regularly publish a 10-year forecast and supply of public housing. on Khao Yi Chao Artificial Islands. The Khao Yi Chao Artificial Islands will expand the scope and capacity of Hong Kong's development and quickly enhance Hong Kong's competitiveness as a financial, commercial and trade centre, giving their close proximity to Lantau Island. The 1,000 hectare artificial islands have good linkage with the Hong Kong International Airport and Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge and are well positioned to tap economic opportunities from overseas and the GBA. To optimize Hong Kong's overall transport network, new rail links and a road net transport network will be constructed to connect with Hong Kong Island, West Lantau Island and Northwest New Territories. A fourth course harbour tunnel will also be built. The Khao Yi Chao Artificial Islands have three major planning objectives. One, prosperity and diversity. They will support the development of the third central business district to consolidate Hong Kong's position as an international financial centre. We also reserve land outside the central business district for emerging industry to provide diversified opportunities for young people. Two, green and livable. Based on the recommendation of the Hong Kong 2030 Plus, we enhance accommodation and living space by increasing the average flat size of public and private housing by a range of 10% to 20% as the assumption when 
planning land development as well as raising the ratio of uh, land for open space and land for community facilities to population to no less than 3.5 square meters per person and three forward-looking and innovative will fully implement the strategy of a smart green and resilient city by formulating measures in urban design infrastructure and mobility to de reduce everyday energy demand we we'll also reduce carbon emission through the adoption of green energy and advanced food waste treatment technology. We will put forth proposals on the scope of reclamation, land use, transport infrastructure network and financing options regarding artificial islands within this year. Our target is to commence the EIA process next year and kickstart the reclamation works in 2025. Our pursuit, the principle of bringing forward infrastructure construction and increasing development capacity, as mentioned in my election manifesto, by taking forward the three major road projects and three strategic railway projects recommended in the strategic studies on railway and major roads beyond 2030. The project will bring about a highly interconnected and accessible road network and rail system and vigorously drive and support future development of Hong Kong. The six major transport infrastructure projects are 1. Northern Metropolis Highway. It will facilitate east-west connectivity in the new territories north between Tin Soi Wai in the west and Kutong North in the east via San Tin and expand transport capacity in the Northern Metropolis. 2. Sha Tin Bypass. This north-south new trunk road connecting Tai Po and Kowloon West will give residents of the new territories east a faster route to urban areas and relieve tra traffic pressure on Tolo Highway. 3. Zhengguan O Yao Tong Tunnel. Construction of the third row tunnel at Zhengguan O was synchronized with the future development of Zhengguan O Area 137 and improve its external connections. 4. Hong Kong Shamjan Western Rail Link. It will connect Hong Sui Kiu with Qianhai to facilitate tra travel between Hong Kong and Shamjan and promote connectivity and integrated development between Hong Kong and the GBA. 5. Central Rail Link. The construction of the 12th railway line will connect Kam Tin in Yunong with Kowloon Tong via Kwai Chung, alleviating pressure on the carrying capacity of the Tun Ma line, and 6. Chung Kwan No line, southern extension. This is an extension of Chung Kwan No line suffers to Chung Kwan No area 137, which will enhance the transport facilities in the area. We'll continue to take forward other railway projects in the northern metropolis. Kutong Station of the Northern Lane will be commissioned in 2027, and the construction works for Hong Sui Kiu Station and the Northern Link Main Line will commence within the current term of the government. We are also actively following up on the work relating to the Northern Link Spur Lines connection with the new Huanggang Port in Samchan, via the H HSITP in Lok Ma Chao Loop. Railway projects in other areas are also progressing well, with the construction works of the Tung Chung Lai Extension, Oyster Bay Station, and Tung Mun South Extension commencing next year. We also expedite the implementation of a number of road infrastructure projects under planning, including Route 11, Cheng Yi Lan Tao Leng, and Tung Mun Bypass, as well as improvements to Lion Rock Tunnel. Leng Oi. Also, we shall work together to safeguard harmony and stability. The government will duly address the aspirations of our people for a better life and build a more harmonious and stable Hong Kong by providing more targeted public services, better supporting the elderly and helping the disadvantaged, as well as creating a better living environment. Hong Kong is our home. The government will unite local communities and engage all sectors in society to build a better Hong Kong together. On health, our present healthcare system relies more on treatment than prevention. Expenditure on public hospital services accounts for over 80%, while less than 20% is spent on primary healthcare. 
not only are resources skewed heavily towards public hospitals, the pressure exerted on them is also huge. With an aging population and increasing prevalence of chronic diseases, public hospitals are overburdened and the waiting time for specialist services has continued to lengthen. Coupled with the impacts of the COVID-19 epidemic, the dire consequences of over-reliance on public hospitals over the years have become more evident. We need to change. The government will revamp the healthcare system. Our aim is to shift the emphasis of the healthcare system from its current treatment-oriented hospital-based structure to a prevention-focused, community-based system by investing additional resources to promote primary health care. We will publish the primary health care blueprint within this year. With district health centres, or DHCs, as the hub for coordinating primary health care services for our people, we will partner with the private health care sector to promote the concept of family doctor for all and collaborate with various health care professions to provide comprehensive, sustainable and people-centric primary health care services in the community. We will 1. Establish the Primary Health Care Authority for coordination and governance of primary health care service provision across the public and private sectors. It will also be responsible for setting standards and devising quality assurance mechanisms. 2. Launch the three-year chronic disease co-care pilot scheme from next year, under which the DHCs will refer people who are screened to be at higher risk of hypertension or diabetes mellitus to the private sector for further examination. Those who are diagnosed with the diseases will receive treatment provided by family doctors and allied health professional teams to help them better manage their chronic diseases and prevent complications. The government will subsidize about half of the examination and treatment fees. A strategic purchasing office will also be set up to coordinate primary health care services provided through the private health care sector. 3. Enhance the elderly health care voucher scheme by allowing the shared use of vouchers between spouses and extending the coverage to include primary health care services provided by audiologists, dietitians, clinical psychologists, and speech therapists under the Accredited Registers Scheme for Healthcare Professions, as well as medical equipment such as hearing aids provided by them upon professional assessment. In addition, we will roll out a three-year pilot scheme to encourage the more effective use of primary health care services by the elderly, increasing the annual voucher from the existing $2,000 to $2,500. The additional $500 will be allotted automatically to the elderly person's accounts upon the claiming at least $1,000 from the voucher for designated primary health care services, such as disease prevention and health management. The additional amount should also be used for those designated services. 4. Enhance the role of Chinese medicine, or CM, by increasing the annual quota of government-subsidized CM outpatient service by one-third from 600,000 to 800,000 and strengthening the CM services of DHCs. 5. Better utilize multidisciplinary health care services, including amendments of the Supplementary Medical Professions Ordinance to facilitate direct access of patients to services provided by physiotherapists and occupational therapists without a doctor's referral. 6. Review dental services by setting up a working group on the development of dental care services to review the existing services and to advise the government on enhancing the service scope and delivery mode. And 7. Rationalize healthcare premises and facilities in the community by setting up a steering committee on healthcare facilities planning and development to take forward relevant development and redevelopment projects. On improving public hospital services, 
Public hospital services are the backbone of our healthcare system. To enhance the services on various fronts, we will 1. Reduce the waiting time for specialist outpatient services. The hospital authority, or the HA, will adopt a multi-pronged approach including 2. 1. Allocate more resources for new cases. 2. Streamline referral arrangements for cross-specialty cases. 3. Set up integrated clinics to provide multidisciplinary support to minimize patients' waiting time for multiple specialists. And 4. Enhance downloading of patients in stable condition to primary health care. The target is to reduce the waiting time of stable new case bookings for the specialty of medicine by 20% in the next financial year, that is year 2023 to 24. 2. Improve patient experience. The XA will provide more convenience for patients by making wider use of telehealth services and introducing a new service model for drug collection and delivery. 3. Enhance healthcare services. The XA will establish the integrated neuroscience centers and cardiovascular diseases centers to provide integrated services for patients requiring multidisciplinary professional support. It will also establish the Uncommon Disorders Registry and foster collaboration with the National Network and the Hong Kong Genome Institute and set up the Poison Control Center to enhance poison control and treatment services. 4. Strengthen hospital infrastructure. We will press ahead with the first 10-year hospital development plan adding about 4,600 beds and about 80 operating theatres in the next five years. The second 10-year plan will include the development of a hospital network in the northern metropolis. And five, promote e-health. We will explore mandating the upload of more types of health records by legislation with a view to further transforming e-health into a key infrastructure integrating public and private healthcare systems. on the supply of healthcare manpower. To help ensure sufficient healthcare manpower for the public healthcare system, we will look into different options, including requiring qualified healthcare professionals to serve in public healthcare institutions for a specified period of time, and admitting qualified non-locally trained dentists and nurses. On the development of Chinese medicine, to further promote the development of Chinese Medicine, or CM, we will enhance the functions of the Chinese Medicine Unit under the Health Bureau with the creation of the post of Commissioner for Chinese Medicine Development to strengthen the development of CM and relevant policy coordination work, which include formulating a blueprint for the development of CM, taking forward the provision of an additional 200,000 quotas of CM outpatient service, regularizing integrated Chinese Western medicine services and gradually expanding the services to more hospitals and diseases, including actively exploring the extension to cancer care, enhancing the implementation of the Chinese Medicine Development Fund, promoting the professional development of CM practitioners and CM drug personnel, and deepening the collaboration in CM between Hong Kong and the mainland and the GBA. On mental health. Mental health is one of the keys to happiness. The government will enhance the mental wellness of the community with services targeting the needs of various groups. We will strengthen the multidisciplinary student mental health support scheme to identify students in need and make arrangements for them to receive professional support at the first opportunity. The HA will allocate additional resources to strengthen community psychiatric services and launch a pilot public-private partnership program for the provision of psychiatric specialist outpatient service. The Social Welfare Department will also strengthen the services of the integrated community centres for mental wellness. Apart from continuing to subsidise organisations to implement community support projects, we will set up a mental health support hotline to provide immediate support and referral services. On tobacco control, our tobacco control efforts will continue even though the smoking prevalence in Hong Kong reached an all-time low of 9.5% last year. We will consult the public early next year on the next steps for tobacco control. 
Her target is to further reduce smoking prevalence to 7.8% by year 2025. We will cooperate with the mainland to facilitate registration of pharmaceutical products in Hong Kong and the use of pharmaceutical products and medical devices in the mainland. To foster medical cooperation between Hong Kong and the mainland, we will make reference to the registration approvals made by the National Medical Products Administration and other suitable drug regulatory authorities, allowing pharmaceutical products registered in the mainland and the relevant places to be registered and sold in Hong Kong upon fulfillment of the relevant stringent requirements on safety, efficacy and quality, thereby diversifying the supply of pharmaceutical products. We will also maintain liaison with the mainland on allowing more Hong Kong registered trucks and medical devices to be used in the GBA. In addition, we will study the feasibility of allowing Hong Kong people living in the mainland cities of the GBA to make use of the elderly health care vouchers for settling payments of mainland medical insurance premiums. On sports development, to further promote sports in the community, we will work with the sports sector, schools and the business sector to promote urban sports that are popular among young people in recent years, such as free-on-free -free basketball, sports climbing and skateboarding. We will also review the competition events of the Hong Kong Games to provide more opportunities for participation of different age groups. The Culture, Sports and Tourism Bureau will map out a 10-year development bl blueprint for sports and recreation facilities, providing about 30 diversified facilities by phases, such as sports centres, swimming pools, sports grounds and parks. The planned facilities include Hong Kong's second sports park to be developed in Whitehead, Mount Shan, and large-scale sports and recreation facilities in the northern metropolis. The government will continue to enhance the professionalism in the sports sector and develop sports as an industry, including enhancing the arrangement of training and competition venues for qualified sports clubs and supporting local sports clubs in their participation in major sports competitions in the mainland and the region. We will also launch a five-year pilot, pilot program on career and education for athletes with disabilities to equip them for post-retirement development. In addition, we will enhance the Hong Kong M-Mark system to support the hosting of at least 10 major international sports events in Hong Kong annually, with a view to further promoting Hong Kong as a centre for mega international sports events. On leisure facilities and projects, we will develop more leisure facilities and projects, adding variety to the activities of citizens. First, I have decided to develop a round-the-island trail of about 60 kilometres on Hong Kong Island, connecting the waterfront promenades on the northern shore and a number of existing promenades and countryside walking trails in the southern district. We will carry out studies and design as well as works from next year onward with the target of connecting 90% of the trail within five years. Two, ecotourism in southern parts of Lantau. We are actively studying the development of about 1,000 hectares of the Green Belt sites in the southern parts of Lantau for ecotourism or recreation uses. And three, weekend buses. The Home Affairs Department will join hands with local groups to organize weekend bazaars at five regions in the territory in the fourth quarter of year 2022 fostering diversified local economic activities. Drawing on the experience, the Food and Envi Environmental Hygiene Department also plans to organize similar weekend bazaars next year. Hi, Guang. On caring and inclusivity. I proposed in my election manifesto to set up district services and community care teams, or the care teams, 
the governments will set up the care teams and will devise governance structures and operational arrangements, provide some of the resources required, and set KPIs. The 18 districts in Hong Kong will be delineated into sub-districts based on organizations and groups to form care teams to pool together all sectors, including young people and ethnic minorities, to take part in community building. The care teams will organize caring activities, such as visiting the needy. We will first set up the care teams in Chun Wan and the southern districts in the first quarter of next year and in the remaining 16 districts in phases. On district administration, the current term district councils will expire by the end of next year. I have asked the Home and Youth Affairs Bureau and the Constitutional and Mainland Affairs Bureau to conduct a review on district administration and put forward suggestions to ensure that the future arrangement will be in conformity with the basic law in adherence to the principle of patriots administering Hong Kong and conducive to enhancing governance efficacy at the district level. On poverty alleviation, the current term government adopts the strategy of targeted poverty alleviation by directing resources to those most in need. The task force to lift underprivileged students out of intergenerational poverty, led by the Chief Secretary for Administration, launched the Strive and Rise program in September through tripartite collaboration among governments, business sector and community. The program targets more than 2,000 junior secondary students, particularly those living in subdivided units, with mentorship, personnel development, personal development, planning and financial support. It has been well received by the community. Upon program evaluation, we will chart the way forward and consider increasing mentee quotas and ex expanding the target group. I have also asked the Chief Secretary for Administration to restructure the Commission on Poverty to study and identify any other target group for poverty alleviation. On employees' remuneration and occupational safety, Labour is key to social productivity and should share the benefits of economic growth. To improve labour rights, the government will 1. invite the Minimum Wage Commission to study how to enhance the review mechanism of the statutory minimum wage, including the review cycle, how to improve efficiency, and balancing a host of factors such as the minimum wage level and sustained economic development and make proposals to the government. 2. Set a good example and further review the arrangements relating to the employment of non-skilled workers under government outsourced service contracts, including remuneration of workers as well as relevant monitoring mechanism. We aim to conclude the review by the first quarter of next year. And three, enhance the procedures of the protection of wages on insolvency fund, including providing legal services by the fund to assist employees in filing, winding up or bankruptcy petitions against insolvent employers, so as to expedite the disbursement of excruciate payments to affected employees. Many sectors are now seeing a shortage of manpower. To encourage the public to enroll in training and enter the workforce, the government will invite the Employees Retraining Board to consider raising the daily rates of retraining allowance and providing allowances for half-day courses for implementation by the first quarter of next year. Fatal industrial accidents result in tragic loss of lives and cause distress to families over the loss of their loved ones. The government will spare no effort in investigating each and every incident, pursuing responsibilities of those who should be held accountable and putting in place improvement measures. We will seek the passage of the relevant bill under scrutiny by the LegCo as soon as possible to increase the maximum penalties for occupational safety offences, thereby enhancing their deterrent effect. Caring for the elderly. Hong Kong has the longest life expectancy in the world. The vast majority of the elderly live and age in the community with the support of their families or the government. Only about 4% reside in RCHEs. Furthermore, about 
Three quarters of the elderly population, among about 1.1 million people, are receiving financial assistance under the Comprehensive Social Security Assistance Scheme and Social Security Allowance Scheme. The government will improve elderly services with due emphasis on both quality and quantity and adhere to the policy objective of promoting ageing in place as the core with institutional care as backup. To strengthen the support for elderly persons to age in place, the government will 1. Regularise the pilot scheme on community care service voucher for the elderly in the third quarter of next year. The number of beneficiaries will increase by 50% in phases from 8,000 at present to 12,000 people in year 2025 to 2026. The coverage of the scheme will also be expanded to include rental of assistive technology products. 2. Set up 16 new neighbourhood elderly centres in the next five years and expand the services in the fourth quarter of next year to cover areas such as retirement planning and promotion of sharing technology. And 3. Expand the HA's Integrated Discharge Support Program for elderly patients by increasing the number of beneficiaries by one-third from about 33,000 to 45,000 people per annum in the third quarter of next year. The number of beneficiaries who can be referred to home support services will increase from about 9,000 to 11,000 so as to support more discharged elderly patients to recover at home. We have to enhance support for carers. Carers play an important role in supporting elderly persons and persons with disabilities to live in the community. They deserve more recognition and stronger support. From October next year, the government will regularise the allowance for carers of elderly persons and persons with disabilities under the Community Care Fund and raise the amount of subsidy. For instance, the monthly living allowance for carers from low-income families will be increased by 25% from $2,400 to $3,000, benefiting about 10,000 carers. In addition, a number of measures will be rolled out from next year, including setting up a one-stop information gateway and a designated hotline for carers, increasing the number of respite service, service places, enhancing the service inquiry system, promoting community-based peer support for carers, and launching a territory-wide publicity campaign to raise public awareness of the needs of carers. We have to lift the quality and quantity of residential care homes for the elderly. At present, there are about 75,000 RCHEs in Hong Kong, of which about 35,000 are subsidised service places. The government is making its best endeavour to increase the number of subsidised service places. Our target is to provide an additional 6,200 places by the end of year 2027, an increase of 20%. Of these, 2,600 places will commence service next year. We will build RCHEs on suitable sites, reserve about 5% of the total GFA in public housing development projects for welfare purposes such as the provision of RCHEs and purchase places from private RCHEs. We will also leverage market forces to boost the supply. I have asked the DEVB and the LWB to put forward proposals early next year to provide more incentives, such as granting GFA concessions, to encourage developers to build elderly service facilities in the private development projects. In the coming five years, we will subsidize an additional 1,700 or more students to enroll in nurse training programs. They will be required to work in the welfare sector for at least three years upon graduation. The government will also undertake a holistic review of the skill and qualification requirements of residential care home staff so as to establish professional standards and a career progression path. On the protection of children, it is heartbreaking to learn of child abuse cases in recent years. We will take forward at full steam the setting up of a mandatory reporting mechanism for child abuse cases by introducing a bill into the LASHCO in the first half of next year. 
We will also provide training for relevant practitioners to facilitate the early identification and reporting of child abuse cases. Furthermore, we have identified areas requiring focused efforts for improvement in residential child care services. We will improve service quality in a holistic manner, enhance service plan, strengthen law enforcing inspections, and engage independent persons to conduct unannounced inspections. On developments of women, in the next three years, we will substantially increase funding for organising activities to promote women development by the Women's Commission from $4 million to $10 million per annum. A Women Empowerment Fund will be set up to subsidise community projects that support women in balancing job and family commitments and unleashing their potential. On ethnic minorities, to further enhance the support for ethnic minorities, we will recruit more ethnic minorities for appointments as employment assistants and general assistants in the Labour Department and set up a service centre on a trial basis to provide emotional support and counselling for ethnic minorities. <laughs> On district environment, the District Matters Coordination Task Force, led by the Deputy Chief Secretary for Administration, has tackled more than 600 hygiene break spots and stepped up routine cleansing efforts in some 4,000 locations across the city since mid August. For the next step, we will 1. Establish the standard mode of operation through rationalising the responsibilities among departments of relevant workflow for implementation in various districts to handle different environmental hygiene issues in an effective manner. 2. Conduct a comprehensive review on the existing statutory powers and penalties regarding environmental hygiene. The first stage is to consult the LegCo this year on the proposal to increase the existing fixed penalty level of $1,500 for offences such as littering and short fund extension. Other proposed legislative amendments will be put forth in mid-2023 and 3. Live up public space and improve streets, including landscaping, beautifying road signs and upgrading street furniture. To ameliorate uh, the near-shore older problems of uh, Victoria Harbour, we will gradually monitor older levels at stormwater drain outlets and rectify misconnection of sewer pipes. For the identified outfalls emanating stench in specific districts, we aim to reduce the amount of sewage discharge by half before end of the 2024. Striving towards carbon neutrality. To reduce the total carbon emission by 50% before 2035, from the 2005 level in order to achieve the goal of carbon neutrality before 2050, it is imperative that we set up the carbonization efforts. We will 1. Conserve energy. Over 60% of our carbon emission is attributable to generating electricity for buildings. Our goal is to improve the overall energy performance of government buildings and infrastructure by more than 6% by 2024 to 2025 will accelerate the incorporation of district cooling system in NDAs, including the northern metropolis, to reduce energy consumption. We are preparing legislative amendments to expand the scope of the mandatory energy efficiency labelling scheme to include more household appliances. By doing so, the total residential energy consumption of household appliances accounted for under the scheme will increase from 50% to about 80%. 2. Promote green transport. The government will cease new registration of fuel-propelled and hybrid private cars in 2035 or earlier. In the coming three years, an additional 7,000 parking spaces with electric vehicle charges will be provided in government premises 
to expedite low carbon transformation in the transport sector, will conduct trials of new generation electric taxis as well as hydrogen fuel cell electric double deckers and heavy vehicles next year. Moreover, we aim to complete two tasks by 2025, which include announcing a roadmap for the promotion of electric public transport and commercial vehicles, and formulating the long-term strategies for the adopt application of hydrogen energy in road transport. We also introduce about 700 electric buses and 3,000 electric taxis by end 2027, and three, promote waste reduction in the community. To achieve the goal of a zero land view by 2035, we will strive to en engage the entire community in waste reduction and waste separation for recycling. In addition, we will expedite the development of modern waste to energy incinerators. Apart from actively preparing for the implementation of municipal solid waste charging next year at the earliest, we will launch a, no a host of new initiatives. First, we will introduce a bill into the LegCo early next year to regulate disposable plastic tableware and other plastic products. Second, we will explore legislation requiring major housing estates and single block buildings with a relatively large number of flats to collect separated recyclables and pass them to recyclers for processing. Third, we will build the first modern waste to energy incinerator near Shaku Chao at full speed and plan the development of second one in Changchui, Tunmun. We we'll also study developing more similar advanced facilities in the northern metropolis. Last, we will launch a trial scheme on food waste collection in public rental housing within this year. The Council for Sustainable Development will be reorganized, becoming the new Council for Carbon Neutrality and Sustainable Development to offer advice on decarbonization strategies. To strengthen collaboration among Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau in combating climate change as well as joint prevention and control of air pollution in the Greater Bay Area, the government is preparing to set up a, a, a super site for GBA air quality laboratories and meteorology monitoring in Hong Kong to provide regional air pollution and meteorological monitoring and forecasting services. On mobility with uh, convenience, we we'll continue to take forward uh, smart mobility initiatives by applying advanced technology in our traffic and transport systems. These uh, include improving the traffic data and ana ana analytics system and exploring the feasibility of introducing smart motorways. We we'll complete a territory-wide travel characteristics survey under the tra traffic and transport strategy study next year, and take forward various pilot projects such as trial of auto autonomous vehicles within 2024. Our target is to promulgate a transport strategy blueprint in 2025 with a view to establishing a reliable, safe, smart, environmentally friendly and highly efficient transport system. The public transport fare subsidy scheme has been well received by the public. I hereby announce that the special temporary measures under the scheme will be further extended for another six months. That is uh, from the 1st of November 2022 to uh, the 30th of April 2023, the government will continue to provide commuters with a subsidy amounting to one third of their monthly public transport expenses in excess of uh, $200, subject to a maximum of $500. I attach importance to the youth development. Hong Kong will prosper only when its young people thrive. Young people are Hong Kong's future. The government attaches great importance to education and youth development. We have to create opportunities for our children to develop and flourish, as well as nurture a new generation of young people with an affection for our country and for Hong Kong and equipped with global perspective and who would contribute to the country and the city. Hong Kong has sound education infrastructure, world-renowned universities and outstanding research talents. The quality of our teaching and learning has ranked among the top in various international comparative studies. Building on this solid foundation, we strengthen our education system on three fronts, unleashing the potential of students, improving the effectiveness of teaching and learning, and creating strong impetus for growth. The key strategies are as follows. One, step up efforts to promote STEAM, that is science, technology, engineering, the arts and mathematics, 
education at primary and secondary levels. Two, support post secondary education to build a strong talent pool. Three, promote vocational and professional education and training. We pet by adopting the strategy of fostering industry institution collaboration and diversify in development so as to nurture multi skill talents. Four, strengthen national education and nurture a new generation with an affection for the country, the city, and the family. Five, enhance the management of the teaching force and promote the professional development of teachers. Six, Rationalize the demand and supply for primary and secondary places in a pragmatic manner and with priority consideration given to the interests of students and quality of education. And seven, support early childhood education and special ed education. We we'll step up the promotion of STEAM education for all, for fun and for diversity in primary and secondary schools, building a solid foundation for students in support of our direction of promoting INT development in Hong Kong. We will, one, promote learning for all. More learning elements of INT will be incorporated into the curriculum with the aim of at least 75% uh, of publicly funded schools implementing and rich coding education at the upper primary level and introducing INT elements such as artificial intelligence in the junior secondary curriculum by the 2024-25 school year. Two, strengthen leadership and coordination. Starting from the current school year, all publicly funded primary and secondary schools are required to designate coordinators to holistically plan STEAM education within and beyond the classroom. And, and starting from the next school year, to organize and arrange students to participate in quality STEAM activities every year. And three, enhance professional training. At least 75% uh, of the publicly funded primary and secondary schools should arrange their teachers to undergo professional training on STEAM within two school years. The government staunchly encouraged the University Grants Committee, UGC funded universities to enhance the quality of programs for building a strong pool for of talent. In the coming five years, our target is that 35% of the students will be studying STEAM subjects and 60% will be studying subjects relevant to Hong Kong's development into the eight centres in the 14th five-year plan. We will gradually increase the number of UGC-funded research postgraduate places by about 1,600 from some 5,600 at present to 7,200 in the 2024-25 academic year. This, together with the gradual uplift of the overall enrollment ceiling of uh, RPG places from 70% to 100% from last year onward will increase the number of RPG places by more than 50%. To attract more outstanding students along the Belt and Road to pursue their studies or career in Hong Kong, we we'll collaborate with institutions to promote the Belt and Road Scholarship to countries outside the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. The ASEAN, the subsidy levels of mainland university study subsidy scheme will also be increased starting from the current academic year with the introduction of new subsidy item for traveling expenses, etc. Moreover, to ease the financial burden of loan repairs under the Student Financial Assistance Scheme for local post-secondary students, the government will extend the current interest-free deferral loan repayment for another year until the 31st of March 2025 on vocational and professional education and training. We will, through the strategy of fostering industry institution collaboration and diversified development, promote VPAT as a pathway parallel to the conventional academic education, providing diversified learning and employment opportunities for young people. We will, one, expand the study, scheme, su study subsidy scheme for designated professional sectors to meet the key power demand for, of designated industries, for example, nursing and information technology, the respective numbers of subsidies for self-financing higher diploma program and undergraduate programs will be increased in phases by 1,000 to 2,000 per cohort, respectively, starting from the next academic years, increasing the total number of places from the existing 5,000 to 8,000. Top-up degree programs will be covered for the first time, and priority will be accorded to programs of a prime nature that involve industry-institution collaboration. Two, Explore the introduction of more applied degree programs. 
The first batch of programs under the pilot scheme on the development of applied degree programs have been launched in the current academic year, covering four disciplines, nursing, testing and certification, horticulture, uh, broke culture and landscape management and general technology. We are actively exploring the introduction of more applied degree programs. Three, expedite the development of vocational qualification pathway, VPQP. We will increase the number of industries uh, adopting the VQP under the qualification framework from six to at least 18 in the next five years. Four, launch the diploma of applied education program. The DAE program will be launched on a regular basis starting from the next academic year, incorporating substantial VPAT elements and providing a pathway for secondary six school leavers, as well as adult learners to obtain a formal qualification. Five, enrich applied learning and workplace experience of secondary, stu uh, secondary students will enhance the senior secondary applied learning courses by offering more courses, option and support and launch the Business School Partnership Program 2.0 with more business partners covering more industries. And six, enhance WePAT promotion. We will organize an array of activities to enhance the public's positive understanding of WePAT and promote its professional image, including supporting the Vocational Training Council to organize the Future Skills Community event this December to make WePAT an attractive progression pathway. On national education, we enhance the adoption of multi pronged and coordinated approach in schools to promote national education within and beyond the classroom, so as to strengthen students' sense of national identity and national pride, and raise their awareness to safeguard the national security of our country together. From the con current school year, we will one support teaching and learning. Schools are encouraged to regularly review the primary and junior secondary school curricula and enrich them with learning elements such as the history and geography of our country. Two, strengthen school-based management. The enhanced school development and accountability framework will be implemented to bolster the accountability of staff in publicly funded schools in providing quality school education and enhancing the national education through the adoption of a whole school approach. Three, organize inter-school national education activities. Government school will take the lead in adopting a whole school and joint school collaborative approach to launch the first edition of Love Our Home, Treasure Our Country series of inter-school activities in accordance with the National Education Event Planning Calendar issued by the Education Bureau to commemorate key national events such as the National Day and the National Security Education Day. School sponsoring bodies will also be encouraged to organize in the school na national education activities. And four, enhance home school cooperation. All publicly funded schools will organize one or more activities relating to national education for parents every year. Moreover, a one-off grant of $60 million will be provided for kindergartens joining the Kindergarten Education Scheme, KES, to organize school-based activities to, and that help students learn Chinese culture from an early age. About 780 publicly funded primary and secondary schools have established over 2,100 sister school pairs with their mainland counterparts. Our aim is to increase the number of local schools participating in the sister school scheme by 10% within next year. We will also strengthen support for students of post-secondary institutions to participate in the mainland exchange and experience activities. On teaching profession, teachers are responsible for fostering positive values and a sense of national identity among students and should therefore possess professional capabilities and have professional conduct to step up the management of the teaching force on various funds such as appointment, conduct and training, the EDB will 1. Extend the coverage of the basic law test requirement. Starting from the current school year, newly appointed regular teachers in all public sector schools are required to pass the basic law test. The requirement will be extended to cover all direct subsidies, CM schools and kindergartens joining the KES starting from the next school year. The test cover the basic law and the national security law. Two, promulgate guidelines on professional conduct. 
The guidelines to be promulgated within this year will clearly set out the professional conduct and behavior required of teachers to be role models for students. The EDP will make reference to the guidelines in handling misconduct cases of teachers in a serious manner. And three, promote understanding of our country. Newly joined teachers in publicly funded schools and teachers aspiring for promotion in public sector schools will be required to participate in the mainland study tours. Moreover, a serving teacher will be offered more mainland study opportunities to understand the development of our country. We are going to handle declining student population in a pragmatic manner. Given the structural decline in Hong Kong student population, the government will keep the actual situation of primary and secondary school places under review. We will adopt the target of soft landing and rationalize the demand and supply of school places in a pragmatic manner with the interest of students and education quality as our priority consideration. We we'll maintain close communication with school sponsoring bodies and sister sector in planning ahead through strategies such as expanding plans to operate new schools, relocating emerging schools, etc. The use of resources will be optimized to enhance education quality. The government will continue to implement small class teaching in public sector primary schools in an orderly manner, achieving small class teaching in over 90% of these schools after two school years. On other support measures, the EDP will continue to support different aspects of education. One, kindergarten education. Uh, a one-off grant of $16 million in total will be provided to all kindergartens joining the KES to assist their development into smart kindergartens through digitizing school administration and enhancing work efficiency. Moreover, a subsidy of $30 million in total will be provided to KES kindergartens for creation of healthy schools by improving the ventilation of school premises and to special education. Starting from recurrent school year, hospital schools will be provided with additional resources to provide hospitalized students suffering from injuries or diseases with a holistic senior secondary curriculum and enhanced life planning education with a view to facilitating their reintegration into mainstream schools after recovery. The strength based program under the project on whole school approach to providing tiered support for students with autism spectrum disorder will also be expanded to help senior secondary students with autism spectrum disorder unleash their potential and strengthen their life planning. This will benefit about 100 secondary schools. Youth development. The HYAB will publish the first edition of the Youth Development Blueprint within this year to outline the principles, objectives, and actions of the government in pursuing youth development. We will, one, nurture a new generation of young people with an affection for our country and Hong Kong and equipped with global perspective, uh, an aspiring mindset and positive thinking. Two, give young people a love and care, attach importance to the whole person development and provide them with an enabling environment to cherish a hope for the future and strive for continuous growth so that they can unleash their full potential in society and contribute to Hong Kong, our country and the world. And three, introduce a series of initiatives to help young people in overcoming difficulties in education, career pursuits, uh, entrepreneurship and home ownership. The blueprint is the government's first major document dedicated to youth development. We we'll implement the initiatives set out in the blueprint and review them regularly for enhancement so as to ensure that they keep pace with the changing social environments and meet the needs of our young people. The HYAB and the Youth Development Commission are now seeking views from young people and stakeholders. They've organized and participated in over 80 related activities so far and are paying visits to all 18 districts to learn more about the views of young people for incorporation into the blueprint. We'll launch the Youth Participation Initiative to engage more young people in public affairs and enhance their interaction and trust with the government. Specifically, we'll one, expand the member self-recommendation scheme for youth. We aim to triple the number of participating advisory committees from around 60 at present to no less than 180 within the current term of the government to enhance their function as talent incub incubators and 
to encourage young people to participate in community development. We will designate two committees on district affairs and open up certain seats for young people to nominate themselves as members. Young people will be encouraged to offer their views on matters such as district works projects, youth development and civic education. I will encourage various departments and professional grades in the government to form youth groups and organize activities regularly to enrich the young people's understanding of these government departments and professions and guide them in their career pursuits and experiencing team, team culture. A number of departments and institutions, such as the, the Seafood Aviation Department, the Hong Kong Observatory, the Agricultural Fishery and Conservation Development, the Marine Department, and the Hong Kong MA, are already preparing for youth groups. In addition, the Security Bureau will enhance life planning and internship opportunities for members of youth uh, uniform groups under the discipline services. It will also establish a Security Bureau Youth in Uniform Group Leaders Forum within this year to offer advice on youth development work across discipline services and organize relevant activities. The government will work on all sectors of the community on a variety of activities to help young people broaden their horizons, acquire a better understanding of the development of country and the world, and develop a proper and holistic outlook. For, for instance, the Hong Kong Laureate Forum will be held for the first time in November 2023, awardees of the Shaw Prize, some of which include Nobel Laureate and world-renowned distinguished local mainland and overseas scientists we will be invited to attend the forum and exchange ideas and experience with young scientific talent from all corners of the world. This international event will help promote local young people's understanding of and interest in science technology. Subject to the development of the epidemic, the government will also enhance the breadth and depth of our mainland and international internship and exchange programs. Besides, the government will launch an annual Hong Kong Youth Festival starting next year. Different sectors of the community will be invited to jointly organize a wide spectrum of activities for engaging the youth and helping them develop their potential, enhance their knowledge, share their experience, etc. The government will regularize the GBA Youth Development Scheme and encourage participating enterprises to recruit and deploy university graduates from Hong Kong to work in the GBA. Besides, we continue to provide the young people of Hong Kong with entrepreneurial support and incubation services in the GPA through two funding schemes under the Youth Development Fund, helping, helping them to address the initial capital needs for their business. Housing for the young people to help meeting the housing needs of young people and facilitate their development, we will, one, provide more land for the Starter Homes project. We will again launch the Starter Homes project in the land sale program in the next financial year. More starter homes projects will help young people realize their home ownership aspiration. As more than 85% of past applicants are for starter homes were aged 40 or below, and to expand the youth hostel scheme. The government will explore ways to increase the supply of youth hostels, including subsidizing non-governmental organizations to rent suitable hotels and guest houses for use as youth hostels, with the target of providing about 3,000 additional hostel places within five years. Youth talents will be charged rental of, of about 60% of the market level. In return, they have to commit themselves to providing district or volunteer services to the community. In addition, the government will identify suitable land sale sites and require developers to sell aside a certain number of threats to support the YHS on a pilot basis. Nasty. We have to combat the epidemic together, tell good stories of Hong Kong and scale new heights. Combat the epidemic together. The COVID-19 epidemic has raged for nearly three years. Its impact on Hong Kong as a highly open economy is particularly evident. The government's anti-epidemic policies are clear and have been taken forward in an orderly manner, with the aim of creating the greatest room for people's livelihood and economic activities. Upon assuming office, the current term government promptly formulated five empty epidemic principles. One, not to lie threat, 
but to contain the number of confirmed cases and prevent the healthcare system from overloading. Two, to reduce critical cases and deaths. Three, to attack high risk groups, including the elderly, children, and patients with chronic disease illnesses. Four, to classify people into different risk levels for proper control in a scientific and precise manner. And five, to strike a balance between epidemic risk and economic needs. I mentioned on many occasions that we should avoid backtracking along our path of combating the epidemic. Our guiding principle is to achieve the greatest impact with the lowest cost. Provided that the epidemic is under control, the government will continue to move forward with adjustments and enhancements to anti-epidemic measures in the light of actual situation and development. This is to ensure that things will be taken forward in an orderly and measured manner. Having assumed office for just over three months, the current government has rolled out a series of precise and risk-based anti-epidemic measures in phases, gradually relaxing our control measures. The, these include cancelling the route-specific flight suspension mechanism, introducing the red and amber codes for risk management, risk-based classification and management, changing the seven-day hotel quarantine arrangement to three plus four and later zero plus three, and relaxing social distancing measures in phases. The zero plus three arrangement implemented on the 26th of September was a major change as it formally put an end to the inbound compulsory quarantine requirement which had been in place for more than two years. Where conditions permit, the government would enhance various measures in a progressive way, including social distancing measures. We also devise specific plans to ensure that major events and economic and large-scale activities in Hong Kong can be held smoothly. Resuming connection with the mainland and the overseas is equally important for Hong Kong and must be pursued in tandem. We are making our best efforts to discuss with the mainland to strive for resuming normal cross-boundary travel in a gradual and orderly manner without posing additional epidemic risk to the mainland. Our first target is to implement reverse quarantine in Hong Kong, also known as pre-departure quarantine. This arrangement will be designated to comply with the 7 plus 3 standard of the mainland, where mainland-bound travellers will be put under closed-loop management after undergoing quarantine in Hong Kong. It will avoid the possibility of spilling over the epidemic to the mainland and re re reduce the pressure on quarantine hotels and manpower in the mainland, providing more certainty for travelling from Hong Kong to the mainland. Subject to the manageable risk level, we are discussing in parallel with the mainland to increase the compassionate quotas for traveling to Samjuan in order to meet the traveling needs of people in the mainland and Hong Kong. How much longer this anti-epidemic journey will take hinges on a basket of five factors. Acting hastily will cause troubles, bringing irreversible risks to society and leading us nowhere. We have to closely monitor the epidemic situation outside Hong Kong, possible risks, Arising from winter influenza, development of virus variants, the capacity of local healthcare system, etc. The public must follow and comply with the empty epidemic measures, as any contravention could hamper our progress made so far and render our efforts futile. As long as we play our part and stand united, our anti epidemic journey will go more smoothly, creating the greatest room for people's livelihood and economic activities. Apart from combating the epidemic, we have also got to tell good stories of Hong Kong. As an externally oriented economy, Hong Kong must look for opportunities beyond the city. We have to be adept at telling the world the good stories of Hong Kong and let Hong Kong shine in the world with an intricate and volatile international political environment, certain external forces have been deliberately smearing our country and distorting the situation in Hong Kong. We have to present the true picture of Hong Kong to the world and promote our strength, achievement 
and opportunities, and that the school and that the city is a good place where people can make their dreams come true. In fact, Hong Kong is a free, open, and international metropolis, and connecting with the mainland and the world. In Hong Kong, an an international financial shipping and trade center is highly competitive. Hong Kong has numerous the, the world's number one achievements, the world's freest economy, the easier place to. Easiest place to do business across the globe, the number one city in air cargo throughput, the largest offshore RMB business center, etc. It is also the only city in Asia with five universities, the world's top 100. All this clearly demonstrates that Hong Kong has many distinctive advantages that make our people proud. Speaking of the most unique advantage, Hong Kong enjoys strong support of the motherland while being closely connected to the world under the one country's two systems. We enjoy a low tax rate, a simple tax regime, a solid foundation of the rule of law and well-developed well infrastructure. Hong Kong is well connected with the enormous markets, including the mainland and ASEAN. As a leading financial center in the world, Hong Kong's stock market is highly active in trading. It is also the leading fund management hub in Asia with free flow of capital and high liquidity. Hong Kong exercises its judicial power independently and is the only common law jurisdiction, jurisdiction of our nation. Hong Kong has a vibrant society. Our people are well educated and our scientific research capabilities have received well wide recognition time and again. Hong Kong has a productive workforce as well as the longest life expectancy in the world thanks to our quality medical services. Our civil services claim for its integrity and efficiency. Hong Kong also enjoy a unique and inclusive cultural diversity, a splendid and diverse mix of East and Western arts and culture, and world-class arts, cultural and sports events. Hong Kong's country parks are scenic and rich in biodiversity, which livened up our leisure and recreation activities. With its low crime rate, Hong Kong is also among the world's safest cities. Indeed, Hong Kong has more good stories to tell, and the government will take full advantage of community efforts to tell those stories. I and my principal officials will lead overseas delegations, including the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation (APEC) Economic Leaders Meeting in November, and the Think Business Think Hong Kong campaign in Thailand next year, organized by the Hong Kong TDC. The financial secretary will lead a task force together with Hong Kong team comprising business leaders, the Hong Kong TDC, Hong Kong Tourism Board, etc., to visit the traditional and emerging markets to rebuild the image and branding of Hong Kong through proactively establishing multilateral ties. The task force will also launch a new visitor program, inviting about 1,000 prominent political, business, and media leaders from the mainland and overseas to visit Hong Kong on sponsorship. Tailor-made arrangements will be made so that these uh, visitors can see for themselves the latest development in Hong Kong and bring home the good stories of Hong Kong. In addition, the task force will work on showcasing the strength of Hong Kong in a more multifaceted and comprehensive manner via extensive multimedia channels and networks. Government, departments and relevant organizations will promote Hong Kong's strength through diversified activities. The Financial Services Development Council and Invest Hong Kong will launch a global marketing campaign presenting Hong Kong's uh, prospects and opportunities as a bridge connecting the mainland and the rest of the world. Radio Television Hong Kong will enhance its cross-media multi-language broadcasting to keep expatriates in Hong Kong, as well as people in the mainland and overseas, a price of the latest development of the appeal of Hong Kong. Our mainland offices will encourage and support representatives from our professional fields and sectors to visit the mainland. Moreover, Hong Kong professional bodies may apply for funding under the Professional Services Advancement Support Scheme to visit the mainland and overseas country to promote their, promotional, their professional services, broadening the international perspective of professionals, particularly the young generation, and showcasing Hong Kong as a vibrant and thriving city. For the, the next five years, it's important for Hong Kong to break new grounds and achieve another leap forward. 
At a time when the world is undergoing unprecedented changes in the century, Hong Kong faces both opportunities and challenges, but there are more opportunities than challenges. I have full confidence in the future of Hong Kong. The key to success is to seize the opportunities of times, of the times, give our best and enhance our competitiveness, building on the governing beliefs outlined in my election manifesto. This policy address has set out more concrete goals and detailed measures. Through the competitive efforts of the governing team and our civil servants at all levels, as well as the support from the community, we will be able to implement all these measures in the policy address that are designed for our people and accomplish what we set out to achieve. Currently, the biggest aspiration of Hong Kong citizens is to have more decent housing, improved care for the elderly, better prospects for the youth in their education and achievements, and more development opportunities in society. Guided by the important speech delivered by President Xi on the 1st of July as the govern governance blueprint for the current term government, it is our hope to better serve our people and better develop Hong Kong so that everyone can share the fruits of our achievements over the next five years. I look forward to working with you all to build a more promising and united Hong Kong where people enjoy living and working together let us start a new chapter for Hong Kong, advancing from stability to prosperity. Thank you. The Chief Executive has delivered the policy address to the Council. After the Chief Executive leaves the Chamber, the Council will continue with the remaining items in the agenda. The Chief Executive will now leave the Chamber. Will members please stand up?